Mount and Blade 2, Bannerlord. Mountain Blade is a totally historically accurate portrayal of life somewhere roughly around uh, 1000 AD, give or take a few centuries on either side. While this game is still technically in early access, it has more than enough content to make it a fun and fulfilling experience. But being that it is early access, and has been for some time, be wary. Let's start this off with the first big choice, what culture your boner lord is going to appropriate. There are six to choose from, and they all have pros and cons attached to them. I'll be explaining a lot of the mechanics of the game as we go through the cultured factions, as their bonuses are quite varied, and will make little sense unless I explain them. First there is Vlandia, clearly inspired by the medieval Western European knights. They gain more renown from battle, renown being the representation of how well you are thought of in the land, and also receive more income serving a faction leader as a mercenary, and an increase to production to villages bound to castles, which increases what that village has available for trade. The downside is that once you're ready to build your own army, it costs more influence to recruit lords to your army. Influence is a resource you build completing actions while serving a faction, most notably winning large-scale battles. You can also earn influence by winning tournaments or donating troops and prisoners. This resource is used for forming armies or voting on your faction's policies for diplomacy, but we'll get to those later. Next is Sturgia a seeming combination of Vikings and Slavs. They have a bonus that makes both recruiting and upgrading infantry troops cheaper. Now, I've seen it debated whether or not all foot troops are considered infantry or not. It's actually really easy to test. Take a look here. This is recruiting troops as a Sturgeon, and this isn't. Notice how the price only changes on one of the troop units. So, at least for now in the game, non-mounted archers, i.e. archers on foot, are not infantry. Going off that going forward, know that there are four types of troops. Infantry, archers, cavalry, and horse archers. Also, upgrading a unit simply costs in-game money once that unit has received enough experience to be upgraded. Becoming either a stronger unit of that type, or transformed into a similar unit with a new specialization. For example, a recruit can often become either a better infantry or an archer, and later potentially even cavalry or a horse archer. There are five tiers to troops, and a special sixth tier reserved for noble troops that are generally the best troops in the game. Each faction has one noble unit. Sturgeons also lose less daily cohesion. An army's cohesion can simply be thought of as an hourglass slowly losing sand. Once depleted, the army breaks apart. You can spend some of your influence to add more sand to the hourglass to keep them together for longer. The negative to Sturgeons is that they receive a heavier penalty when it comes to disagreeing with someone during diplomatic decisions. This is where you spend your influence when passing laws. But honestly, who cares if you make some pussy angie? They's a bitch anyway. Northern, Western, and Southern Empire are a representation of the Roman and Byzantine Empire. They pay less to garrison the troops, which is a cost you pay to station troops in an owned castle or main town. They also gain more influence while being in an army. Now, note a quote, army doesn't include just you roaming the map with the troops you've hired. You either have to join an army of a faction you're serving, or create one yourself once you've sworn yourself to your faction's leader, or create your own faction entirely and start an army there. Any heroes you've hired to serve your personal clan who you've set to have a party of their own can be called upon to join your army free of influence. But parties from another clan, even within your own faction, will require you to spend your influence. The Empire's downside is that village hearths increase at a slower rate. What does that mean? I have no idea. I think it's tied to population or increases to their production, or how fast they respawn their recruits, I legit don't know. The game's encyclopedia doesn't even have any information on it. Remember, we're still in early access, boys. Or more likely I'm an idiot and miss something. The Asarai is, a, I'm guessing, probably a combo of pre-Islamic Arabia and Berbers. They are able to start caravans for cheaper 
which are mobile traders that you have to put down a hefty flat fee to bring in some stable income passively, as well as less of a, quote, trade penalty, which just translates to being able to sell items for more. They also have no speed penalty on desert terrain, which is insanely useful if you plan on trekking through that kind of terrain to chase down other parties, armies, or looters. Their downside is that they pay more in daily wages for troops that are in your party. While a low percentage, this can certainly add up when you start growing that party size. The, uh, Kuzait? 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 Clearly Mongolian conquerors are all about them horses, baby. They recruit mounted troops of any kind at a cheaper rate. Have a bonus to production in villages owned by Kuzait leaders for horses, mules, cows, and sheep. They do receive quite a bit less tax, however. Batania, a representation of Celts, are excellent in forested terrain, receiving less of a speed penalty and gaining increased sight while traversing it. Towns owned by Batanian leaders also produce more militia, which is similar to garrison troops, except they are not placed by you, they are produced naturally and defend the towns, but cannot be removed by you, unlike your garrisoned troops. Batanians do, however, build town projects slower, which are ways to increase the town's garrison troop limit, food stocks, production, and the like. Now we're on to how deformed you intend on making your playable character. This is mostly aesthetic, but there is an argument to be made about the height of your character, how easy it is for enemies to reach you and for you to reach them. But you know what? Who cares? Be a manlet, be a giant, have it your way. Now that you're in the game, it's time to learn about combat. The basics are pretty simple here. There are four directions both you and NPCs can attack from. Up, down, left, and right. Generally speaking, up is chop, left and right are swings, and down is a thrust. You can also block in all of these directions. So if you see a hulking sturgeon barreling at you winding up a two-handed axe swing to your right side, quickly snap your mouse to the right and right-click to block in that direction completely deflecting the attack and allowing you a moment in their recoil to counter faster than they can react to. Hopefully. So combat comes down to a dance of a uh, rock, paper, scissors, long glaive of trying to trip up your opponent while reacting to their attacks. However, weapon types also play a huge factor. For example, the most fun weapons in the game, pole arms, have incredible reach, but a finite striking point and usually very slow swing speed. So while they are perfect for mounted combat or keeping your distance in a large-scale battle, they are easily outclassed in short-range melee combat against a smaller axe or sword. Also, you'll frequently run into shield users that will just hunker and hard block your attacks. So you might want to focus on two-handed weapons and break those shields as well. But of course, archers are also devastating. Not only that, but every weapon, and just about everything else you can do in the game for that matter, is also tied to a skill, and each skill is tied to an attribute. The higher your attribute is, the higher you can level the skills tied to them. You also gain focus points, which you can use to invest up to five times in a specific skill to make it level up faster. For every 25 skill levels in each skill, you have to choose one perk out of two choices that, in general, have a twofold permanent buff. One is directly to buff your character, such as an increase to weapon damage or swing speed, movement speed, and the like, and secondly a buff to either troops in your army or settlements under your control, like how many troops you can hire and have in your party, or keeps the populations of settlements you own happier with you. These secondary buffs can sound unimportant or underwhelming at times, but many of them are insanely useful. 275 is the soft cap for your skills, but most of the skills at 275 offer a bonus that then scales with any skill point you've gained over that limit. The Vigor attribute is linked with melee weapons, the one-handed, two-handed, and polearm skills. Leveling them up simply requires actively using them. The Control attribute is linked to ranged weaponry, such as bows, crossbows, and throwing weapons. Like melee, simply using them in combat levels them up. The Endurance attribute branches out a little bit. It is tied to the Riding skill, which is leveled up by traversing the map while mounted, as well as mounted combat. The Athletic skill, which is a pain in the dick to level because it requires you to travel on the overmap without a horse to level up, or deal damage while on foot. 
which is far more dangerous. It is also tied to the smithing skill, one of the most important skills if you plan to go to large-scale war, but we'll get to that later. The cunning attribute is a mixed bag of high IQ boys and underhanded tactics. It's tied to the scouting skill, which is basically just using your eyes to see things, like how far away you can see enemies barreling toward you on the map, but also finding bandit hideouts. The tactics skill, which involves the system in combat of commanding your troops on where to move on the battlefield and what formations to use, as well as the roguery skill, which is all about being a bit of a dick, focusing on raiding villages, murdering farmers, and recruiting bandits into your party and selling prisoners for a hefty profit. The social attribute is all about how well you control your social anxiety and are able to communicate with others without coming across like a retarded chimpanzee. It is tied to the skill Charm, which is about what you'd expect in being able to persuade people and increasing your relationship gains. The Leadership Skill, which is tied mostly to leading an actual army, not just your party. And the Trade Skill, which is tied to, quote, trade rumors, which you can use to gander and ponder what trade goods would best be sold where. The intelligence attribute is less about actual intelligence and more about a learned and practiced set of talents. The first skill tied to int is steward, which is all about the politics of owning and running a town, and making sure the needs of your troops are met, like being paid and having a variety of food. The next is medicine, which is simply how quickly you can heal both yourself and your troops after being wounded in battle. And lastly, the engineering skill, is all about building siege engines or siege defenses during either assaulting or defending a city or castle. So, you've made your character and you understand the combat and skills. What now? Well, you can't conquer the world just by yourself. You need to establish your clan and get to recruiting your party and eventually your army. And wisely choose what forces to put together so you have all your bases covered. Or, you know, get an army of exclusively Batanian Fian champions. <clears throat> anyway, there are a few things you'll want to make sure you know before going to all-out war. When you're starting out, you want to think on a small scale, get a core force built up, kill a few wandering looter groups, make some minor cash, maybe win a few tournaments, betting on yourself along the way, and earning some low to mid-tier weapons and armor. Figure out which faction you might want to serve as you watch them take over the world or for that matter, work on your own faction and take over the world, which by the way is far more difficult. Do you want a force of the most versatile unit and simple to upgrade? Batania is for you. Do you want a healthy mix of crossbow sharpshooters and heavy cavalry? Maybe Vlandia is the way. What if you want some solid shielded infantry, cavalry, and horse archers? Well, Empire all the way. What if you want some horse archers that fan out and swarm the enemy like a Starcraft carrier? Kuzait's here for that. What about a faction that's more of being a jack-of-all-trades and well-rounded in everything they do? Yeah, Asurai reporting for duty. And then there's the biggest brain play you can possibly do with the Sturgeons, being the best at absolutely nothing. Now, mind you, you can recruit from any faction's units, so who you side with won't affect your troop selection much. Also remember, a village's unit selection is based on whether or not they are owned by a town or a castle. If you're looking for the noble base units, like Batanian Fian Champions, or Empire's Cataphracts, you'll want to recruit from places tied to a castle, not a town. Either way, whatever faction you choose, the game plan is to stick with them long enough to go to war and start taking over castles and towns from your enemies. Once a faction takes one over, there is a vote held to see who will take ownership. And of course, you can vote for yourself. This won't always net you ownership as other people will contest your vote but it's a place to start. Or if you're tired of dealing with other people, just kill them and go to war with everybody. If that's how you want to play it, there are some key things you need to be ready for. One, money. Wars are won by who has the most money. Tale as old as time. Sure, once you are a prosperous overlord, you will passively make bank, but getting there is expensive. At this time, in my opinion, there is only one viable way to get those kinds of stacks, smithing. This was even nerfed in the most recent patch by a lot. But the problem is, there isn't anything that really gets anywhere near this kind of profit margin, still, even with the nerfs. And we need boatloads of cash if we're going to go to war on our own. So, 
Run the Batanian circle of buying every damn piece of wood you can, because we're going to need a lot of charcoal. And you're going to need to get used to this sound. I'd also recommend leveling smithing on two different people, as you can level up the skills of any hero you've hired into your clan. Being able to only choose one skill or the other for smithing is an incredible hindrance. So, why not level two people up and get all the benefits? Essentially, one to craft and break down the items to learn more recipes so you can more quickly get the most expensive crafts to sell, and one who smelts the raw product, like wood into charcoal, or into ingot, ingot into better ingot, and so on. Number two, diplomacy. When you're on your own, you're going to realize real fast people don't take kindly to newcomers. Just about every faction is going to declare war on you. When you're fighting on that many fronts, you're destined for failure. We built up Scrooge McDuckian stacks of cash for a reason. For now, we're going to use some of that cash to keep the dogs off. Try to only ever be at war with the one faction whose land you intend on taking yourself. So what we're going to do is make peace with all of the others. However, that's going to require us to pay them off. Now when you are ready to wipe the one you are at war with off the face of the earth, you might be tempted to take their tribute. Or not. 3. Policies Once you start owning and defending a few castles and towns, which is hard enough as it is, you might be annoyed to see the pathetic little peasants trying to rise up and lead a revolution. Randomly in the middle of all-out war, you will lose a castle or town to rebellion without warning. These revolts are no joke, and can completely halt you on your holy crusade against the lesser factions. If you don't take steps beforehand, or at least after your first rebellion, you're likely to get overwhelmed. Thankfully, there's a fix for this. Policies. Especially if you're leading your own faction and take care not to let other clans sully the great name of your kingdom, you can pass any law you damn well please as the Chad dictator that you are. During this great time of aggressive expansion, you'll want to look through the policies and pass every law that grants your people as much loyalty and security as possible. This will trick those dirty little peasants into believing you are a benevolent leader and not a warmongering dictator. Number 5. Heroes you can hire a finite amount of heroes to join the ranks within your clan. Make sure you diversify their skills, because you won't be able to level every skill on your own, and you'll want to make sure you cover as many bases as you can. Don't just hire the first person that shows up in a tavern, or just hire them because they look like they'll make a nice big titty goth GF. Number 6. Prisoners You'll want to find as many skills as you can reach to reduce the chance your captured enemy lords can escape because as long as they're not out there in the world, they can't be out there assaulting you. Don't be tempted by the offers that come in for a few thousand monies to release them. It's not worth it, fam. Keep those crafty little shits locked up nice and tight for as long as possible. Number seven, get good. I know that's usually a low-tier meme used when there aren't really any answers to give otherwise, but it's kinda true. Unless you utilize your troops to their strengths, use a little actual strategy in your battles, and learn how to fight with this combat system, you're not going to be able to be the conqueror you've always wanted to be. Familiarity breeds capability. Stick with it and make the game familiar so you can make it your bitch. Of course, you'll need a proper banner to be a banner lord. So make sure you browse the reddit for a code, or make one yourself, and get the mod that allows you to simply copy paste that code. While you're there, you can browse for some other useful or immersive mods, I wouldn't recommend anything too fancy for your first few times playing the game. You'll notice I use a mod to have my soldiers carrying their clan's banners into battle, and fire ignited arrows, which is simply aesthetic, so you can pull a reverse 300 and make your arrows light up the sky. Once you've conquered the world, maybe it's time to settle down, ensure the stability of your realm, find a proper partner to have some children. Or, you know, get bored with peace, reverse some of those policies so a few people might think it's a good idea to have a rebellion, so you can relive the glory days of crushing your enemies beneath your feet. <clears throat> Thanks for hanging around today. Hope you enjoyed your time here. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe and all that. I've got a few more things in the works lately, and I hope you'll be around to check them out. Have a hell of a time out there, Bannerlord. Yeah! <laughs>
Ugh. <sighs>